Welcome to another special week of Lunch Money, uh, US Shares edition. Um, my name's Leighton, I'm one of the co-founders of Sharesies, and this is Sonia, another one of the co-founders of Sharesies. Um, for the last couple of weeks, we have been chatting all about US shares here on Lunch Money. Uh, we started with an intro to two US shares with financial consultant Tyrone Ross, which was an absolute highlight. Uh, it was followed by an Ask Me Anything session with our product manager, John, who is also, of course, always a highlight. Uh, and if you've missed any of those episodes, you can check them out on our YouTube channel or via our Lunch Money podcast, which is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Uh, today, third highlight in a row, uh, we're joined, joined by business journalist Rod Oram for a deep dive into the US economy. Uh, Rod is a regular contributor to Newsroom, 9 to Noon, and News Talk ZB, uh, so you've probably heard lots of him uh, covering deep sustainability, business, economics, and innovation. Just a reminder that if you have any questions for Rod, you can submit them through the Ask a Question button down below. We don't really chat, follow the chat uh, off to the side. Uh, and always a legal disclaimer, which is there's no personalised advice, so it's our opinions only, um, and we won't tend to answer questions that get too personal. Um, and finally, just be, please be kind and respectful towards our speakers uh, and your fellow viewers. Otherwise, we will have to take steps to remove you from the webinar, which we definitely don't want to do. Uh, we're going to skip the news or share market update again today to jump straight into the Q&A with Rod. Uh, but if you're keen to stay in the loop with what's happening in the markets at the moment, then just make sure you subscribe to our Lunch Money Market email. Um, there's a link off to the side now and it goes out every Monday, Wednesday and Friday and it covers both the New Zealand and share market, uh, New Zealand and US share market. Sonia, I'll hand over to you to introduce Rod. Excellent. So um, as Leighton mentioned, we're joined today by Rod Oram, a business journalist and I think with so much going on at the moment, um, hugely excited to talk to Rod and get his views on what's going on. Um, so please do check any questions you've got in the chat. Um, I think Rod is, yes, welcome Rod. Hi. Uh... <laughs> Excellent. So thanks heaps for joining us today. Oh, my great pleasure. Uh, kia ora to you both, Sonia and uh, Leighton. Great pleasure to be on the webinar with you. Thank you. So to kick off, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Um, who are you and what's your story? Oh, right you are. Uh, I'll keep this very brief. <laughs> um, I like to say that I'm 23 years old as a New Zealander, uh, so I, I'm still you know, young and exploring things, but I was 46 when I arrived here. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, being here in New Zealand these last 23 years, both myself and my family, um, has, has quite changed us. You know, this place has had its way with us. So although I might still sound a bit English, I feel very New Zealand. Um, I've been a business journalist for a long time, um, since 1975. And in fact, um, uh, when I was studying economics at university in the US, uh, that was when Richard Nixon as president took the US off the gold standard. Uh, so what I've been through from end of the gold standard in 1970, that would have been actually 72, uh, through to where we are today uh, has been an extraordinary experience. Uh, and I just love being a business journalist because um, it's my way to try and make sense of the world. Um, I, I just figured out at an early age, if you just try and follow the money, uh, that it starts to explain a little bit about how societies and uh, um, work and uh, so that's essentially my role as a business journalist. I love that. Mm. <laughs> um, so as you know we've just added US shares to sharesies <clears throat> and part of what we're talking about here is an introduction into the US share market and the economy. So at a high level can you tell us what's happening in the share market at the moment in the US? Yes, uh, overwhelmingly there is just uh, on one hand, this vast amount of money um, seeking places to invest. Um, it's because of um, more than a decade now of quantitative easing um, from central banks, uh, initially because of the global financial crisis and then lacklustre growth afterwards. And now that uh, quantitative easing has massively increased. Um, so the Fed's uh, balance sheet um, has ballooned spectacularly this year uh, by far more than it did um, after the GFC. So we've got all this money sloshing around. Um, and it's very hard to know where to put it. So if you're in bonds, well, yields are virtually well are negligible and could well be heading negative in many places. 
um, and therefore there's there's not any upside for capital in, or income there. And so uh, people have been turning ever more to stock markets. Uh, so I think that's uh, one of the very big factors. So this has been um, the deepest, quickest bear market uh, pretty much ever in stock markets with um, when the pandemic finally hit uh, in the US and globally um, from late February onwards. We saw this uh, extraordinary drop in markets, seen this even more remarkable recovery since. And um, uh, as I say, probably the deepest, uh, shortest, quickest uh, bear market ever. Uh, I find it um, very difficult to um, try and uh, have a, a deeply thoughtful, measured view as to what this all means, because we are uh, in a very literal sense, in uncharted territory. And there are parallels, uh, and I would happily come back to this later, um, in the period from the early 80s to the 1987 stock market crash. Because in 1982, there was a sudden huge turnaround, both in um, uh, a lot of confidence that um, rampant inflation had been finally knocked on the head, and um, so there's this huge shift out of bonds into equities um, and that triggered uh, an extraordinary run up in markets globally and of course in the US. Then we had the 87 stock market crash um, and um, in some ways there are parallels to this. But um, this is still has all sorts of complexities and factors that we were never dealing with then. And uh, it's very hard to know where it's all going from here. And so interesting that you've got such that um, great background or have, having seen these different events. Um, what are you seeing at the moment in the US economy? Uh, first of all, a great deal of uncertainty. Um, and there's essentially uh, three reasons for that. The first one is the pandemic itself. And so the US has been dealing extremely badly with it um, because of complete lack of political leadership, um, but also a very substantial segment of the population are deeply uh, dismissive uh, or refuse to believe the science and the rest. Um, and um, so the social response uh, has been pretty irresponsible in the States. Um, so it's one of the highest case and um, death rates um, from the um, pandemic uh, around the world. What that then means is there's a great deal of um, uncertainty, fear uh, uh, and insecurity in the economy as a large uh, as a whole. In fact, so many jobs have been lost that um, uh, total employment in the United States is now back to where it was. And I think in about 2015, certainly uh, below, well below where Trump uh, became president and uh, the U.S. economy um, even with the uh, uptick in um, employment in August, here's a really important thing. That's monthly data, but it's based on a forecast or a survey done in the second week of the month. So the recent e uh, employment data was actually polling the market, the employment market in the second week of August. And things got worse since. And so there are still the U.S. economy is still 11 million jobs short of where it was before the pandemic hit. And um, then um, Congress has completely failed in its job uh, after a pretty good start on it, on the uh, CARES package, the original first pandemic uh, pa pandemic. Um, support package uh, it was a good comprehensive one uh, to follow through so um, more money for the unemployed um, uh, and other subsidies uh, and support uh, has not has not been renewed and it looks as though the deadlock in congress uh, means that's not going to happen uh, this side of the election and and that won't get better unless there is a, a change of uh, control of the senate um, and um, of the white house to be blunt and um, so uh, this is an economy in the US which is, is actually really struggling. And of course, you get great variation. We're seeing it obviously in the stock market and there's some uh, obvious reasons why big tech stocks are doing well um, uh, and other sectors aren't. Um, so uh, the hospitality and um, tourism sectors are, and entertainment sectors are, of course, still very hard hit as are the airlines, um, but uh, other sectors of the economy are doing reasonably well. So an incredibly mixed picture. 
And then I'll say there's one last big factor, which is um, I think the US is in really uh, quite a parlous state as to whether it can maintain um, its technological and um, economic um, leadership in the world. Um, under Trump, it's pulling back from a lot of international leadership anyway. And where it is trying to exercise it, um, it's uh, some of it's quite off the wall. Um, and um, China has not only grown its economy hugely, but extraordinarily increased its science and technological capability, its innovation capability. Um, so one of the longer term uh, questions I have about the US, US economy um, is if it's actually going to regain um, not just a good level of economic activity, um, but regain a real confidence um, in its innovation system, um, in its science and research systems, uh, because that's what it's going to need um, if it's going to um, uh, re-establish itself. I think there's some doubt now that it's still got that number one slot uh, in terms of um, the most advanced um, and um, capable economy in the world. And you, talk, you touched on it a little bit, but mm. we've been hearing about the disconnect between the US share market and the economy. Uh, can you explain what this is all about and why that's happening? Yes. Now, I'm just going to um, look back at some data I was just looking up. And um, one way of looking at um, share markets is what uh, the value of a share market is as a percentage of GDP. Now, a really big caution here. When you're looking at the value of shares, that's a stock of value because that's um, how much all those companies are worth in the share market. However, GDP is actually measuring a flow of economic activity. Um, so you've got to be very careful to understand that one's a stock and one's a flow and they aren't directly comparable. However, you can use this measure to uh, get some insight into how dominant uh, a share market is in, a, in the US economy. And what I was looking up was um, back in um, uh, 1990, US stock markets were only worth 60% uh, equivalent to GDP. Um, in 1990, it had got to 120%, and now it's 200%. And um, so uh, that's an extraordinary um, growth in the value of those shares. Uh, and it's quite clear um, that those share, the value of those shares no longer has any relationship to the value of the economy, if you like. And then uh, uh, just to set that in an international context, if you go back to the extraordinary uh, asset bubble um, in Japan in the 1980s, um, they, their market um, peaked in 1989 at 140% of GDP. And even that at the time was considered uh, uh, unhealthy and, and uh, off, the, off, the, off, the, uh, off the charts. Another way of looking at it is uh, what's actually going on in those companies um, on the stock market. And this is a lovely bit of data from the Brookings Institute in the United States, <clears throat> that if you go back to 1962, when there were really big companies on the stock exchange like AT&T, the telephone company, or General Motors, um, the two of them employed 1.2 million people. Um, but if you look, at, and they were the two largest companies on the stock market back then. But if you look at the two largest companies um, on the stock market um, today in the US, um, they only employ 280,000 people. So um, there is a there's very substantial disconnect uh, between the value of those companies uh, and the um, the level of their economic activity uh, versus the economy as a whole. Having said that, you can still drill down in a stock market, particularly as one as wonderfully large and diverse as the US, and um, to pick sectors uh, that are uh, far more hands-on in the real economy and therefore are a better proxy uh, for economic activity. And therefore, um, that's a, an, a very interesting place. Um, it's always an interesting place to look for uh, stocks to invest in. But it's a particularly interesting place these days um, because of these huge disparities between sectors, depending on how they're coping with the pandemic. Well, so interesting, um, Rod. Uh, 
tied into all this at the moment, there's um, a lot of talk around volatility, so the ups and downs of markets. Mm -hmm. And I think even something as large as the mm -hmm. S&P 500 index at the moment, trading up and down over 2%. Um, you know, every morning I wake up and check, it seems to be these big numbers of volatility. But um, one of the interesting roles you had was uh, as a Wall Street correspondent, I believe, covering the crash in 1987. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear from you um, well, a little bit about that and also how it compares to what's happening at the moment. Yes. Uh, well, the risk of sounding like, you know, an old bloke who's been around too long. Um, I, I was a, a young journalist at the time, I hasten to add, or younger. And uh, I'd, I'd already been at the Financial Times in London for some years. Uh, but I got my first overseas posting and it was to New York um, to be the paper's uh, Wall Street um, correspondent. And um, I was appointed to the job in May of um, 1986. And uh, my wife and I were visiting New York to see where we might live and all that kind of stuff. And I desperately hoped that this extraordinary stock market uh, 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 tear and boom would continue at least until I'd arrived. Well, as I was scheduled, um, we did arrive in September of 86 and it kept going until October 87, famously Monday the 19th, uh, 19, uh, 1987. And it was a very memorable time for me because I did have uh, a year in the job to really get to know Wall Street um, and lots of people on Wall Street and, and um, lots of people to talk to. But as it happened on the Friday before the stock market crash, um, I was out in um, Omaha, Nebraska, interviewing Warren Buffett. Uh, he was a, a very impressive investor at the time, but f nowhere near the household name he subsequently became. And it was quite an extraordinary experience because as he met me in the uh, lobby of his very modest offices and we walked down the corridor to, to his office, um, the walls were lined with um, newspaper front pages of stock market crashes through the generations. And um, he didn't want to talk about where the market was at because he was always a long-term value investor and he thought it was all crazy what was going on. So I had a extremely wonderful morning with him and uh, I did some more stuff in Omaha and flew home that uh, back to New York that evening and um, of course it's pre-text messages and <laughs> internet and all the rest so I wasn't really plugging into what had happened on Wall Street on the Friday afternoon and I knew it was a triple witching hour uh, where a combination of um, deadlines coincided for uh, various options and futures um, and triple witching days were really rocky days because they tend to could, used to then cause a huge amount of volatility in the market. Uh, and I, I knew one was coming, but I didn't take any notice. On the Saturday morning, I uh, picked up the New York Times off the, my front doormat of my apartment and saw it had been a spectacularly awful day. And um, I spent the weekend talking to people in the market, trying to work out how the market was going to perform on Monday because um, I was on duty that weekend and I had to write a news story for the Financial Times. And um, the market makers, the people on the New York Stock Exchange who use their own capital to literally balance out um, buy and sell orders in those days um, to make those markets, were utterly shell-shocked because they had completely exhausted their capital on Friday and they weren't able to um, establish um, a price at which stocks would trade. And so the stocks were literally in free fall. And just to set that in perspective, um, uh, when we got round to the Monday, um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 22% in a day, uh, which is way more than has happened any day since. And um, sitting in the New York Times office that uh, uh, it, it, sorry, in our New York office for the FT that day uh, with my colleagues. We were watching the old uh, Telerate screens, um, you know, early digital uh, technology there, and um, all the market measures that um, you know, I tracked you know, hour by hour were just completely off the charts. One last story about all this. When the market closed, I took the subway downtown to uh, the stock exchange. And um, I've never been in a press conference where... Uh, journalists were palpably scared. Uh, there, there was an extraordinary sense of fear in the room. Uh, as a, um, even I, as I thought a relatively experienced financial journalist, was going, well, this is pretty amazing. Uh, 
So one very panicky journalist uh, said to John Phelan, the chairman of the stock exchange, oh, you know, these the stocks, they've fallen, you know, 22 percent today. If it goes on like this all week, uh, they'll go to zero. What's your advice? And John Phelan, who is this wonderful uh, Irish American New Yorker with a completely straight face, but with a twinkle in his eye, said, well, my advice would be to buy at one. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, um, the next week was extraordinary because uh, we had this huge dance between the um, futures and options markets in um, Chicago and the uh, stock markets in New York and the Fed in Washington. And what was making matters worse was huge miscommunications between those three crucial players in all this. Uh, and uh, by the Wednesday, the markets, the whole financial system had come perilously close to collapsing entirely. And the reason it didn't was there was a misunderstanding between the futures market and the cash market. Um, um, they both thought that the other was going to cease trading. And, and so that uh, just took the heat out of the issue and they stopped chasing each other down. And that finally took the pressure off um, to allow um, the exchanges and the Fed um, to restore some sort of sanity by the end of the week. So um, far more perilous in many ways than anything we've seen so far. Um, but again, I want to stress that um, the markets are so big these days. Um, there's so much money sloshing around um, that in, in some ways um, there's, a, there's a greater problem storing up here, um, which makes me um, apprehensive, I'd has to, have to say, if... Uh, people in business, people in politics, people in society in, in general, um, don't, you know, keep calm <laughs> uh, and uh, try to navigate us through uh, what's going to be a, a very, very difficult few years ahead. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, I, was rem uh, I was reminiscing too much. <laughs> it's, anyway. a, it's, a, it's a great answer. So many <laughs> things that I feel like we need to speak more about in the end, mm. not least. I mean, did you end up having McDonald's for breakfast with Warren Buffett or? Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, he, he offered me a Diet Coke. That was it. Right. No, but that's still very cliched, Warren, from, from what you read about him online. Yeah, but, I but I, I must just say one thing about Warren Buffett, because he yesterday... Uh, he did the most extraordinary uh, half a billion dollar um, financing of Snowflake, a very, very interesting upcoming IPO um, in, uh, uh, in cloud computing, data storage. And uh, I'm fascinated he's done that because he's always been so strict uh, in it's one of his key disciplines, has been only to invest in companies that he understands. Um, and uh, so he you know, shunned Microsoft, even though Bill Gates was a, a good friend of his for a, you know, for a long, long time. And so I'm really thrilled, uh, seeing as he's uh, about 27 or 8 years older than I am. No, sorry, about 17 or 18 years older than I am, uh, <clears throat> that it's still possible to learn new tricks when you're an old dog. <laughs> I have to read about that afterwards. Oh, do. Um, so... There's an election coming up in the US. It's hard to avoid that particular fact at the moment, 3rd of November. Um, what kind of impact do you think that this might have on um, share markets in the US economy? Uh, I take a deep breath on that one. Um, it's um, very, very hard to predict. The, the, the simplest way of looking at this is that um, if um, Trump wins... Uh, it will probably be quite close uh, and there will be a lot of concern um, that the election hasn't been uh, fair and credible. What it would be even more concerning, and uh, there's an awful lot of war game stuff going on in the States to understand this, is if Biden won um, not just the popular vote, um, but also won a very slender majority in the Electoral College, uh, that Trump would go on air that night and declare um, that uh, he was the winner, uh, he, or if he, if he was slightly ahead, he was the winner. Uh, and then the most extraordinary uh, amount of politics, um, litigation and everything else ensues from that. It would be 
astonishingly destabilizing. And that's a very real risk that people are taking uh, seriously. So, but if Trump is president, what you'd have is a great deal more policy chaos, uh, policy contradiction uh, and everything else. If, you, if Biden won, uh, there would be a lot more stability. Uh, and uh, that would be um, a good thing for the US economy. So uh, at this point, I, I probably just leave my prognostication at that level um, because uh, uh, trying to build on the beyond those two broad themes um, is, is actually pretty difficult. I suppose I, I should add one caveat, uh, a hopeful one, is that um, the US economy is large, multifaceted, as is uh, US society. And um, th 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 there is some bedrock, sensible stuff goes on in the country. Um, and um, th that's, that's where, where I'd be looking for comfort. Great, thank you. And so, so if you're new to investing in US shares, because um, knowing that a lot of our investors, this will be their first time um, getting into it. We've talked a lot about what's going on in the economy at the moment, uh, but what are the key things that new investors should keep their eye on and what are we likely to see in the short and long term? The, um, what I'm about to say is, in a sense, incredibly generic advice and it would apply anywhere. And that's, um, sorry, I'm going to preface this by saying one thing. Um, I'm terribly excited um, that such is the technology of uh, to for individuals to trade very simply and cost effectively, thanks to Sharesy and, and other services. Um, that's attracted some people to be direct participants in the market. And my very fond hope um, is that this is um, kind of a, a level of um, uh, 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 civil society engagement back in the markets. Um, but my really fond hope is that people become um, shareholder activists, even as very uh, modest shareholders. So that's why I'm, I'm delighted, for example, as uh, at Sharesies, you take uh, that governance question seriously. And I know it'll, I, I'm guessing it'll take you a while to build up that capability on the US stocks. Um, but I think it's really important that we shareholders um, do express our views to companies and get involved when major investors um, have um, serious motions before AGMs and, and, and vote our shares. So, so that's why um, that to me is a big positive about what's going on now. But back to my generic advice. The first one is that um, be sure only to um, uh, put to work uh, a, a modest amount of money uh, that you can afford uh, to uh, enjoy uh, when you do well and you can afford to um, cope with and not get too depressed um, if you um, suffer some setbacks. And remember that uh, when you're directly investing yourselves like this um, in equities, um, then uh, it's only a part of a far more complicated process um, of uh, building up and, and running your financial security over time. Um, and look, even though I'm um, closely involved in these issues, I mean, not nearly as much as I was decades ago when I was a, um, a stock market reporter, um, but I've always um, used uh, professional financial advice for those far more complicated questions about where I go over time. Um, the next thing is um, to um, try to to play to um, themes uh, either around a sector or a technology rather than uh, and buy broadly into that through particularly the likes of exchange traded funds, um, which I th think are one of the great innovations in stock markets over the last 10 years. And it's very interesting to see how a huge amount more money is going into ETFs these days. Um, and uh, rather than trying to pick individual stocks, because the danger when you pick individual stocks is that you'll get swept along um, by uh, all the hot talk about what's going on. It's very hard to be cool and detached uh, when you're picking stocks. It's also um, very hard to avoid um, a, a sort of a, a bit of a confirmation bias. And 
here's an obvious one. You know, I've got a lovely Apple computer and lovely Apple iPhone and, uh, you know, it's iCloud services, it's email services, iTunes, you know, uh, App Store. They're all wonderful. Therefore, Apple's a wonderful company. Therefore, I'll buy some shares. But over the last two years, the value of Apple on the stock exchange has doubled from one trillion dollars to two trillion dollars. But Apple isn't worth twice what it was two years ago. Oh, and by the way, it listed on the stock market in 1980. So it took from 1980 to 2018 to get to the first trillion. So um, uh, you can afford to be a bit sentimental about some stocks, um, but, but just try and be a little bit dispassionate. The next thing is uh, be patient. Don't be a short term trader nipping in and out of the market. And, um, and then I, I want to reiterate the first point is um, however small you are, be a shareholder activist. It's just like uh, being voting in an election. You know, you, you know, here in New Zealand, my vote is only one of whatever the number is, three million votes or how many people there are over 18 in New Zealand. Um, and um, so in the stock market, I'm an infinitesimally small shareholder. Um, but exercise your democratic rights as a shareholder activist. I love oh, sorry. Can, can um, I, can I, sorry, I, I, well, I want to explain that point a little bit more. Um, good companies are a tremendous uh, force for good uh, in the economy, in society. Now, environmentally, socially, economically, politically, our societies are moving on very, very fast. Therefore, we need companies that can innovate and um, be very effective in this. So that's why um, I think being involved as, as a shareholder um, and feeling that you are putting some of your personal, albeit a small amount, of your uh, well-being, your personal wealth, um, uh, to pick some of those companies and try to support them is a great thing to do. But again, um, in making those choices, you, you can do that passively, you can just buy the shares. Um, but to take that extra step of feeling that you're exercising um, your shareholder democratic rights is a fine thing to do. And so to make sure we don't get caught up in um, our own confirmation bias and things like that, where should, where can we go to find out more information about US shares? Um, it's very difficult because um, there's an awful lot of, um, inf uh, and I, I'm going to draw a strict um, demarcation here, there's an awful lot of information around um, and a good deal of that is um, unfounded, wrong, unreliable and everything else. Um, so trying to um, find um, good advice is hard um, and um, it, it usually requires um, spending some money, <laughs> which is difficult. I mean, in relative to um, the investment you're making in the stock market. Um, however, um, reading um, the market uh, reports of, of reliable sources um, and um, that might require, uh, depending on your source, and I, I, I'm self-promoting here as a, not, I'm promoting journalism here, not necessarily um, newsroom itself, um, is that, um, you know, there is obviously good journalism around um, and uh, whether it's uh, some of the, of the investment magazines uh, or um, other media platforms, um, it is worth uh, investing uh, a little bit um, in, uh, in such sources of information. Um, the next thing is, um, once you get the hang of um, trawling around uh, online, um, you can find uh, various sources of, um, of, of reasonable advice that are free, but it's really important to try and triangu triangulate it. So just don't take um, one source as you know the gospel truth or oh, that sounds good, I'll act on that make sure you're getting at least three points of view and, and then trying to see how they fit together um, would be a, a, another really important um, point to make. And I'd have to say um, that because I'm not um, uh, a, an, an active investor currently, uh, and anyway, uh, when I was still active, uh, I was not spending a great deal of time 
uh, I was spending very little time um, researching particular sectors because I, uh, all my time as a business journalist is, is spent on those bigger economic uh, issues and particularly how, for example, uh, we um, speed up uh, our work on our trans transformation to a, a net zero carbon economy by 2050. So uh, I've been, in, in that sense, uh, quite a lot more um, detached from the market uh, and therefore um, uh, I'm reluctant to say, well, there's this source or that source. Um, so that's why I've been a bit more thematic in my answer there. Great. Thanks, Rod. Um, we are going to go to some questions from some people who have been listening today. Um, and for this one here, we call them quick fire rounds. So the aim is to answer within like five or 10 seconds. So oh, right. um, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're going to um, hopefully get through a few. So I'll put my timer um, on. <laughs> um, and just for uh, people listening to awareness, we're not going to be answer, answering product specific questions today. We're just going to be focusing on the ones um, for Rod due to time. But if you have any suggestions or questions, then feel free to just, uh, well, more than feel free, we'd encourage you to um, message into our um, customer care team and they should be able to uh, help you out with those. So, <clears throat> first one, Rod. Um, see how you go in 10 seconds here. Uh, yeah. A lot of speculation about there being a tech bubble in 2020, similar to the 2000 dot com bubble and crash. Is this likely to burst this year? Any di idea if it's going to <laughs> burst before November? Some sp sp pretty specific questions in there, but maybe just speaking broadly to the, the, the bubbles. Um, I think there's every chance of a serious setback for tech stocks. Uh, I know we've seen it this week, um, but it's very different from the dot com boom where a lot of it was on very flaky conceptual companies, uh, whereas um, a lot of the um, acceleration of value has been around companies with have, uh, intrinsically good businesses, you know, the Fangs, you know, the five big ones particularly. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is from Paul. Um, it's if I buy NZ ETFs tracking, for example, the S&P 500, I pay 0.34% of fees, but if I buy the same index on the newly available US market and shares these charges, 0.5% management fee plus a 0.4% foreign exchange fee, what's the point of investing in US shares using your platform with such high fees? Um, Paul, this might be another one, a good one just to send through to um, our uh, customer care team. Um, a quick summary there is the ETF that you track um, on the exchange um, does incur foreign exchange fees and management fees or brokerage fees and all that, and it's included in the unit price of it often. But we've got, I'm pretty sure we've got a um, good response if you email through on what those are, and it will basically be on how long you're wanting to hold it for and how much you're investing. Um, the next one, next one is uh, another one for you, Rod. Uh, what would the American post-COVID economy look like? How long will it bounce back to pre-COVID time and strength and weaknesses of the American economy? It's very hard to think about this other than sort of alternative scenarios. Um, the U.S. economy is very adaptable and therefore when if confidence returns um, and uh, the pandemic was under control, um, I could see uh, some pretty rigor vigorous growth. But those are two very big ifs about the pandemic being under control. I mean, whether or not it's going to be a, a, a vaccine and how quickly that is in place and how many people get it, how many anti-vaxxers don't get it. Uh, those all make that judgment about the, how the US economy is going to track very difficult to make. Great, thank you. This one's from Gordon. Rod, should would Kiwis invest in the US market or stay local and invest in our own market until both countries' are, uh, elections are over and everything is settled? Um, absolutely both uh, and don't wait. Uh, I think one of the most important um, pieces of advice that I've learned early and have always lived by uh, is invest long term. So you're in, you, you, you know, don't wait for something to happen like an election to be over because uh, markets uh, pretty much have made that judgment before that event uh, and have built in the outcome they're expecting. Uh, and so invest now. Um, and stay there long term and ride out these uh, short term, very big 
problems of elections and the rest. Um, but crucially, do invest in both um, because there is access to um, sectors in the States you can't get here, a very big economy, very different from Mars. Um, and therefore, um, you are diversifying your investments by uh, investing in both. And, and diver um, diversification is always a good thing to spread your risks. Great, thank you. Um, this one, great question here from Simone. Um, what do you see as the trigger to end the low interest rate cycle? Uh, inflation. And uh, I just don't know when that's going to happen uh, or if it's going to happen. This is very difficult economically because uh, wise people try and explain why we have all this money sloshing around and it's not causing inflation and inflation expectations remain very, very low. And so that's why um, interest rates are going negative um, because um, central banks are desperate uh, to get monetary policy to have some kind of effect on the economy. So interest rates are going to remain very, very low. Um, until um, uh, uh, inflation starts to rise. And that's when central banks will have to keep um, pushing up interest rates to try and um, uh, kill off that inflation. Great, thank you. Um, this one here is, uh, is the US Treasury still printing money? We spoke uh, briefly about this earlier. Is that why the market hasn't crashed yet? Uh, it's, uh, it's the Federal Reserve that is creating money, not the U.S. Treasury. Um, so that's the difference between uh, our reserve bank. So it's central banks that create money, uh, not governments. What then happens is governments are then able to uh, access some of that money created to uh, uh, issue more bonds, uh, which is exactly what our government's doing. Um, but yes, the Federal Reserve has says that it's going to do whatever it takes. And I'm just looking at the data here on a chart I have in front of me, uh, which is the size of um, the Fed's balance sheet as a percentage of GDP. And um, it's now up to about th the balance sheet of the Fed is 35 percent of US GDP. It's not, sorry, it's not 35% of GDP. It is equal to, and again, I stress we're talking stocks and flows here. Um, but um, before um, the global financial crisis, the Fed's balance sheet was 7% of GDP. So uh, it's increased fivefold uh, at a time when the economy has also grown. So that's how extraordinary it's all got. The European Central Bank's even more extraordinary. Um, its uh, balance sheet uh, is now uh, approaching about 47% of Eurozone GDP. And uh, before um, the global financial crisis, it was at about 12%. So lots of quantitative easing going on. Uh, that's one way to measure how much is going on. Great. Thank you so much. Just looking at the time here, we're going to um, leave the questions there for today. Thanks so much, everyone, for sending them through. And we'll, um, if there's any that we go through afterwards, um, we might clear them up uh, at the start next week. But I'll hand over to you, Sonia, to wrap up. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in today and for asking um, so many great questions. And a huge thank you to Rod for joining us. Um, seen so many great comments coming through um, and, yeah, great stories, great insights. Thank you so much. Lots of invites back in the chat, Rod, so we'll have to... Oh, I'm happy <laughs> to come back any time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so, so that wraps up our special three-part US Shares series. Uh, next Thursday, we'll be jo joined by Lewis Graydon, who's the CEO of the NZX-listed company Fisher & Paykel Healthcare. Uh, we'll pop a link in the chat for you to register for next week. Um, but other Otherwise, thanks everyone for joining in and see you next week. Thanks heaps, Rod. Oh, thank thanks, you. Thanks, Rod. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.